Hey there! Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. The following production is part of the We Be Geeks podcast collective. Welcome. Neverland is mine. <laughs> We're going to bring ghosts from all over the world. Join us. Be sure to bring your death certificate. Hello and welcome to our 402nd episode, of course, as you just heard, I am your spider fan, Jeremy, and welcome to Neverland. Yeah, that was a slightly different intro, that's one I actually made back, I think, 2016, made that intro when we were doing the Evil Land. Uh, I say we, in the collective sense, I had kind of this story thing where, like, the ghost host had taken over the show in October, and I think I mentioned it last week, but that was the intro we had, and that was your evil ghost host in there. But yes, this is Neverland, the Phantom Nexus. I am your host, the Spider Pan Jeremy. Normally, I would go and I'd dive into some news and things, and there was a lot of new trailers and all kinds of stuff this week that I would talk about in the show, but this week is special. I had a good, long conversation with Phil Lawler, who was a longtime writer, one of the originators and creator, actually, of the character Wit from Adventures in Odyssey, the longest-running radio show in our modern times. There might have been longer-running radio shows back in the day where radio was it, where before, you know, before television. But you know, it's to have a radio show that's been going as long as it has now, coming up on 35 years this November, is impressive. And uh, I'm going to have to have him back on sometime because we really got to talking a lot of different type of things, and you can learn a lot. I just kind of sitting there and listening, and and you know, absorbing and stuff with uh, with Phil, and. So it's going to be different. I would like to talk to him about the craft of writing and some of the different stuff. But I think we got a lot of the stuff that I would have asked uh, with uh, when I was talking with um, Marshall Younger last on the last episode. Uh, he kind of got into some of those as well without me really having to ask him stuff. Uh, I am working on maybe some some future guests. Uh, I, I want to make contact with Paul McCusker, who is another one of those original writers at AIO, and I kind of want to run this series. Um, also... I need to, there's some other people I want to get in contact with. I'm trying to make some contacts and get some more interview things. Uh, although we do need to dedicate an episode here very soon to the Black Adam film. Uh, so that will be coming up very, very soon. And we'll have Lost Boy Phil back on with us to talk about it. But uh, let me get on here with uh, Phil Lawler. As I said, one of the head writers of Adventures in Odyssey. Uh, maybe when we have him on next time, I'll break down a little bit more information I find on him. Uh, but for now, enjoy. Come on in. We're nightmares on the best part of my day. But hopefully the conversation will be so scintillating you won't even think about your stomach or anything else. It's just, it will just be all fascinating the whole time. Yeah. Well, you've got quite to live up to. Marshall Younger did a pretty good job. He was a lot of fun to talk to. <laughs> yeah, Marshall, 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 Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> I've talked to him. He's not that interesting. <laughs> I talked to him this morning. It wasn't that interesting. <laughs> Well, he's a fun guy. He's kind of like he's kind of laid back, you know, very, very kind of cool that way. And so, he's a nice, he's a, yeah. he's a wonderful guy. I really enjoy talking to him. We've become very, very good friends uh, over the years, and uh, especially since I came back to the program, he's he's uh, we've really become very good friends since then. And um, and I'm glad that he, he is the showrunner. I'm glad he is the the heir apparent showrunner um, of the of the show. I think that's going to be really good for the show. Uh, itself in the future when we old timers finally shuffle off this mortal coil they'll continue on without us and they'll be under good leadership with marshall awesome all right well we'll go ahead and get this thing kicked off then i actually might just put that out and put that in as a preview at the beginning of the show because that's just a nice, nice segue because <laughs> i'm gonna have a series and i'm thinking you know if i keep this up i think i can find paul mccusker i think i've already found him on facebook and i know i just mm-hmm. recently found kathy buchanan I'm like you know i could just do a whole series of all the different writers and 
go from there? Well, we've all been on different kinds of podcasts. We've all done a whole bunch of other uh, mm-hmm. other podcasts. Not that yours isn't wonderful, and not that it's going to be not going to be great. Um, but um, yeah, sure. I mean, I think everybody would be willing to talk, and it would be really, really fun to, to have everybody together talking. And um, if we all ever did get on the same uh, uh, program, there there would. I think uh, I think there would be an explosion of some sort because I don't think anybody <laughs> would ever hear anybody else or ever talk to anybody else or ever you know. You know. Yeah. It'd have to be a very very specific topic for all of us to get together and talk yeah. about. So. And I have lost complete control on the show before, like with with Odyssey yeah. people even. Um, even I had uh, let's see, I can't remember who it was that had passed away, but I actually had Katie Lee and Townsend Coleman on at the same time. And mm-hmm. I just, I'm just sitting there, just listening the whole time. I just let them go and talk to each other. Uh, I think it was, uh, it was, oh, it was, it was probably when Will Ryan passed away. So uh, no, this was actually um, the. the, the like to talk. I think it's Christine Cavanaugh who was Goslin on Darkwing Duck. Oh, oh, oh. right, right, right. But yeah, yeah. Be, before yeah. Will passed away, I did. Uh, Katie did surprise me one time. I was having her come on to talk uh, when they were revised their book. And she surprised mm-hmm. me and brought Will Ryan onto the call, which, you know, he never hardly did anything. So I was like, oh, yeah, he didn't. But yeah, he, he didn't particularly like doing these things. Yeah. But uh, he, he turned had, the tables and was asking me questions their, uh, <laughs> Well, he, he had to be talked into doing Katie had to do some mighty, mighty, uh, mighty bold persuading to get him to do tell you later mm. uh, when they did it. But I'm so glad they did because, you know, it was very, very wonderful. They did it. Basically, that was the last year of Will's life. Yeah. And uh so they have now these wonderful, um, you know, wonderful podcasts and wonderful videos. And Will was just so creative and so talented and, uh, you know, pick up a pick up a ukulele or guitar and he can make up a song in 30 mm-hmm. seconds. And, and, and not just any kind of song, a really good song. He was an excellent songwriter and an excellent performer. And, uh, and so it was it was just great that, that they were able to do all of that in the last year of his life. Yeah. But I, I never expected that. He completely turned the tables, was asking me questions for most of the time. <laughs> Because he was curious about well, uh, he was a very inquisitive. Yeah, mm-hmm. he was a very inquisitive guy. That was that's what he did whenever we did our Fort Blanket review shows. That's what he did whenever, whenever we appeared in public. Uh, people would want to ask him questions. They would want to, you know, they were always very curious about him, and not just with Odyssey, but with all the stuff that he did in his career. He actually got interestingly enough. I didn't know this. Uh, Katie showed me he got a mention on the Emmys. Um, last last uh, monday whenever they showed him last monday he was in a in memoriam they actually showed a picture of him and the whole bit so yeah so he was you know will was quite well known in the industry mm-hmm. he was a member of the academy he was he did a lot of, of stuff for for um, quite quite a lot of stuff in the industry and uh and odyssey was odyssey was part of that and uh, and it was a big part of that i mean that was the thing that that he did pretty much well, I don't want to say exclusively, but he did that more than anything else during the last, you know, the last 10 years, last, well, five to five to 10 years. Yeah. And, uh, and he was, you know, he was very happy. We, we had, we were, I, I knew him for a long, long time and it was a really, really fun time the whole, the whole way down the line. And we had some great conversations and some really inane conversations. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but he was, he was a great, a great man. And I really, really enjoyed him. I miss him a lot. I miss him a lot. It's, it's coming up on a year now. Oh my uh, goodness. Is, it is, isn't it? Is, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's in September. He was going downhill pretty rapidly during September mm. and October of last year. So it's coming up on a year soon. My goodness. Can't believe it's been that long. Yeah. It seems like life has been moving. You know, the older I get, the faster life moves. I know. I know. The older you get, the faster my life moves too. So, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, that almost reminds me of some uh, this kind of funny thing I saw actually on social media today. It's like, hey, this only happens today only. I'm I'm sure this person couldn't have been serious, but today only. If you take your birth year and add your age, it'll be the current year. I was like, this person had to have been <laughs> yeah. kidding, but yeah, basically people were making fun of it, and I was like, yeah, they, I don't know that uh, they yeah. were serious when they put this post up. Otherwise, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's yeah you know, that's the problem. That's, yeah, that's part of the problem with modernity. That's probably part of the problem with social media, and and it's been part of the problem ever since basically those things were invented. You can't, you don't know what's sarcastic anymore. You don't. We have no idea what sarcasm or what what's a joke and what's not a joke and what's you know what, when somebody is just having fun and playing with words. Mm-hmm. I, I can't tell you how many times I've done things like that. And, 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 and invariably there's somebody who says, I don't, I don't understand. What do you mean? I'm like, it's a joke. Dude, yeah. have, we, have we gone, have we gone that far that we really don't even know what jokes are anymore? <laughs> yeah. Now they, they fact have. check them yeah. now. 
<laughs> yeah. He didn't really Maybe stand stuff. on his head for three hours. Well, yeah. obviously not. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. And but see now also we've we've learned with social media that there are people who are just stupid. So it's hard to tell. Okay, <laughs> yeah. if you don't know the person that made the that was, was were they joking or is they really that dumb? So we're now we're like, Whoa, you know, I don't know. But so, I, I say yeah, I suppose that's one of the blessings, I suppose, of social media. You know, you really find out who's stupid and who's not. <laughs> Unfortunately, it looks like there are far more stupid people out there than not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can't even remember what the one. I, there was something I saw even today that uh, I, I I had to roll my eyes. Like I, I hope they're kidding. But there was even one. I swear this this one had to be a joke. There's a, a YouTube channel I like to watch where they go and they react to funny stuff. And they had and I, it, either somebody thought they were really conning people or he thought he was really reading it. But they had a guy who was he was looked like he was in a competition and he was supposed to be speed reading and he was just taking books, flipping through, going. And I was like it. This got to have been a joke. I, seriously, this guy wasn't trying to compete for fastest speeder and fooling anybody. So, yeah. yeah. Well, people will do anything to get their 15 seconds or 15 minutes or whatever the 15 part of it yeah. of fame. That's what they want. The world of TikTok, in which I've, I've yep. unfortunately had to join because I'm rebuilding my audience. <laughs> uh, well, you know, that's how it works. Yeah. I suppose I just, these days. I I, I'm, I'm very suspicious of TikTok and. Yeah, pretty much. Facebook is the only thing I'm on. I don't. I don't even like Twitter. Yeah, I don't uh, either. <laughs> but I, I still get. I still get Twitter notifications about stuff. But I. I just don't. I don't really like LinkedIn. I don't like anything else. I just. I just do Facebook more than anything else. Yeah. Well. And that's only because I have you know a granddaughter, and that's where the pictures are posted. So. Yeah, Facebook's the only way I can keep track of some family members that have moved all over the country. Yeah. So, but now I, I just use everything for trying to promote the podcast and. After COVID and after I dropped the Disney Focus, I lost a lot of audience. So now I'm like yeah. having to rebuild and going taking the show of kind of a new direction. And we're being mm. more open about some of our faith in there between me and my co-host is also my pastor and best friend since I was seven years old. So good. we're we're Excellent. being a little more open on some things. So very good. That's what we need. Oh yes. We need joyful warriors. That's what we need. And that's what we try to be. I try not to rant on everything that's stupid that's happened. <laughs> Because <laughs> because I cover a lot of movie and television stuff, and occasionally something just is so stupid that I'm like, I well, think I mean, I'm just going to skip I, this. I, these <laughs> days, these days, I don't know what you can cover on movies and television. They're all remakes. Yeah, they're all insipid remakes. So how can you just go watch the original? You know, I mean, good grief! Don't don't. I I, I can't believe that we have entered into such a non-creative period uh, from the major media that we have from from the people who. Pr- who provide us with our major media it's just I, I keep screaming we need our own media we don't need any of this stuff we just we need our own forget all of this stuff forget all of that you know we don't need that that's all derivative nonsense yeah. and then they're just trying to and then add wokeness to it and it's like uh, that makes it the worst stuff ever <laughs> yeah they're, they're they're not concerned about telling us good stories anymore they're tell they're they want to preach to us all their agendas uh. Which? You know, I, I, people people used to call Christians Puritans, and they mm-hmm. made, made fun of them. There's nothing worse than a secular Puritan. <laughs> you know, um, and, and when I say Puritan, I'm not talking about real actual Puritans because the real actual Puritans were wonderful, wonderful mm-hmm. people who did more for this country than anybody ever will know. I'm talking about that 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 ridiculous mock up of Puritanism that people were, were using. There's nothing worse than a secular Puritan. It's just the worst worst combination of of everything. It's just you know no. Uh, in your face, uh, uh, whiny, complainy, offended victims all the time. And, and if I don't like it, you can't do it. And that's mm-hmm. all there is to it. And I'm like, man, oh man, oh man, you guys complain about you. You guys thought Christians were bad when Christians <laughs> at least had a had a had a moral behind what yeah. they wanted to do. They called themselves the moral majority. You know, <laughs> at right. least they had morality behind it. You don't even have morality. It's just whatever offends me is wrong. Yeah. Whatever offends me, you got to stop doing. You got to get out of here. You can't do that. You can't say anything. Just looking at you offends me. So you got to <laughs> go. You got to go hide. Yeah, and so, I was even just seeing today oh, how sad. on the multiverses game where you have Velma from Scooby Doo, who one of the her things that she can fight other opponents is that she could solve the mystery, put their face on a one plus, or the police will show up and cart off whatever enemy it would could have been Bugs Bunny, could have been Batman, could be Superman. But because LeBron James was on that game, a black man getting taken away by police could offend some people. So Uh-oh. they removed it Uh-oh. and decided to put the Scooby-Doo mystery machine because that's not creepy that a van mysteriously comes up and picks you up and drives off that may smell of <laughs> whatever Shaggy's been, you know, smoking in the back of that van. That's not creepy <laughs> at all. 
<laughs> oh wow! Well, yeah, the world's well, gone nuts. But in the world of this nuttiness, with all these non-creative adventures and odyssey, has managed to go on for our. Are we like thirty-five years into this now? Thirty-five. Thirty-five. It'll be thirty-five in November. My goodness. In November. How in and, the world uh, do you keep we'll it have, fresh? We'll be about a thousand. We'll be at one thousand episodes. I think in a couple of years, uh, the way we release episodes, we're about fifty episodes away from a hundred from a uh, thousand episodes. So yeah, I mean it's um, who knows? It's the, that's the that's the it, well, who knows? It's God. It's all God. God did it. We didn't do it. We're just <laughs> we're just the tools, you know. He, he's the one who's doing it all, and we we're very grateful that he is continuing on with the program and, and sees a, a value to it, a use for it. We want to continue on as long as he'll have us uh, do it, and so um, we just we just give all the praise and the glory to him. That's that's the way it works. He. God, God is a, a wonderful, of course, in the way that he provides us with our own talents and, and desires and everything. But he also is wonderful in how he plants stuff in front of us. You know, he, 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 I don't, I don't want to get to I'm in touch with God, that kind of thing, because I'm not I, I, that, that's too off in the weeds. But yeah. I do think that God does poke us every once in a while and he does he does show us things and he does. Um, allow us in the in the study of the word and in the study of of human the human condition and the things going on around us to say you know what you have a talent and, and you have a you have an outlet um, you you have something that's already been created and already done you need to talk about this you need to, mm-hmm. you need to talk about this. you need to you need to present um, you know present the the godly and gospel and scriptural alternative to these things and so um, especially what's what's going on out there and that's why I I look at Adventures and Odyssey and I say you know and I try to get across to all the writers. I try to get across to everybody who works on it. That we're we can't we can't be second best. We we have to we have to do great stories well told on on all of the stories that we put out. And if it's not great stories well told, if we not if we're not doing the best job possible, if we're not raising the bar every single time, if we're not doing that stuff, then we shouldn't do the show. We shouldn't do that that episode. We should. And that doesn't mean we're going to succeed every single time. We're not perfect. But we want to get as close to, uh, you know, cl- as close to the as- aesthetic objective, the objective aesthetic, which is, you know, goodness, truth and beauty. Yeah, that's God. We want to get as close to that in our art as we possibly can every single time. And that just demands a lot from us. So mm-hmm. so keep us in prayer. That's yeah. one thing that everybody can do. But but I'm but I'm so serious. It sounds very lofty. It sounds very snobby. And I'm not trying to be that way at all. I'm just simply saying we can't be second best. We can't settle. Yeah, we, it, it, nobody should. Nobody should. But I know. I, but I don't. I don't work for all the other programs. I only work for the programs that I work for. And 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 uh, good enough is not. Good enough is not. Mm-hmm. It's not good enough. So, um, you know, we we just have to continue on and, and try to do the best we can. I'm. <laughs> I get worked up about this because I'm writing <laughs> books about it. I teach courses. You know, I teach my writing courses. I teach. Uh, courses and uh, I, I have taught at the university level at, at courses in popular culture that sneaks its way into my writing courses. Uh, I have I have stuff out there. I'm I'm I've, I've taught these courses um, online with with folks with with uh, for Azusa Pacific University and for other places as well. I'm about to take all of this stuff and tool it so that I have an ongoing online course and that that, that anybody can can take whenever they want. Um, and it's a video course and, and, uh, it's about writing about foundational elements of writing. And, um, a lot of people say, well, I already know the foundational elements of writing. Yeah. Well, you, you don't, <laughs> <laughs> um, cause if you did, I'd see it in the stories that you produce. So, uh, um, I, again, I mean, I'm going to get creamed for that, but, but, uh, <laughs> That's not, that's, I, I don't, I don't mean to be snobby. I don't mean to be like, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm Mr. Know-it-all and everything like that. Although I, I'm sure that that's the way I come across. It's, <laughs> it's not what I mean, but, um, but it's, I just feel like I'm just very, very, very passionate about the fact that we should, we can't settle. We can't, and, and you know, the Christian market uh, is a sub market of the bigger market, mm-hmm. but we have to be as good as anything out there. And, and right now that's not hard to do, you know, <laughs> Especially story wise, yeah. story wise, that's not hard to do at all. There's no originality out there at all anymore. It's all just derivative nonsense and yeah. and and terrible derivative nonsense at that. And uh, and so we should we should really be uh, just the place where everybody wants to go to hear a great story well told. Yeah, and it, it's very addicting getting back in because I uh, 
I had been away from it because I don't, I don't, I think just only recently I found out there is a station in Kansas City that's starting to carry the program again. And, mm-hmm. uh, but I had a long time I wasn't, because normally what I do is I go to the library and I check them out. And so I, I've been catching up from album, well, whatever, basically from about the time that Wooten and Penny got married, however many years ago uh, that's been, I've picked up yeah. from there, which the, the ties that bind, uh, which they tackle some very tough issues in that one, which I mean, it's still, it's even more relevant now than it was even a few years ago. Oh yeah. But I just recently oh, yeah. caught up through, through 72, but once you get going, like, you know, I, you have to just keep going cause it's, it's very compelling. And even Marshall and younger and I were talking about part of it is these characters are so relatable that yeah. either they remind us of bits of ourselves or people we've known, or even the situations they go through are, are very true to life. Even when there's, some bit of silliness in there because there's always a great amount of fun, uh, you know, even with, uh, you know, like Buddy, this highly imaginative character who reminded me of there was a character similar to that years and years ago that would always get caught up in his imagination. But Buddy was this highly imaginative character and all the fun he has on yeah. a particular snow day with this hill that he wants to go down and he really is trying to impress uh, Olivia Parker the whole time. It's just, yeah. but it's just this fun goofiness, but yet you can still relate to that because we've all been at that age, like where we thought we needed to do something ridiculously stupid to impress some girl, and yeah. really they weren't impressed by that. <laughs> yeah. Girls are not impressed well, by I, our I, stupid I, stunts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and for some reason, we just never get that in our heads. Right. I mean, we, we just never bother. You know, we every generation does the same kind of stupid stunts. Um, well, you know, the, the humor part of it is really important for us, of course. We mm-hmm. all, we've always felt like we wanted to make sure that we had uh, good elements of humor. We wanted to make sure that it wasn't so heavy duty. Um, uh, and, and then, you know, like you said, sometimes downright silly. I have no objection to any of that. That's really all very fun. I think, though, that as we go along, as we get, as we get more and more into it, uh, and as we gain more and more skills as writers – um, so we're, you know, we're, we're apprenticing writers right now. We're bringing them up through the ranks and, and trying to teach, uh, teach all of them, the, the, the new ones, uh, about how we do things and what, what we should be doing. And, um, as we do that though, as we go, as we grow, as we grow as writers, hopefully we're trying to, to branch out. We're trying to spread out. We don't want to get stuck in a rut. We don't want to, you know, there, there are times when it seems like on Odyssey and I'm, I guess I'm, I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn or not, but there are times on Odyssey when I feel like, well, everybody's talking like they're in a Neil Simon play and everybody's talking like they're, you know, they're, they're at Noel Coward is at the piano tossing off on Mars and, you know, it is, it's all, it's all, you know, that's not real. That's what we, we need to call, call that back and not, not have everybody be uh, right at the ready with the punchline, you know, right mm-hmm. at the ready with a snap comment and a snappy retort. Let's, let's keep, let's keep things in the realm of reality. Um, you know, unless there's a really good reason not to, if there's a really good reason not to, then go, you know, we can go ahead and do that. But, um, so, but, but just in like normal conversation, we want, we want to, uh, relate things in, in, in normal, in normal, normalcy. And I know that, uh, beyond that, Dave Arnold and I talked a lot about over the years as the two older elder statesmen, I guess on Odyssey, they're, you know, still working with the program and everything about just the, the nature of the early days and what we did in the early days and, and, and versus what we feel like we really kind of need to do now. Um, and what we saw in the eighties in the eighties and the nineties in the heyday of the evangelical, you know, we were on the vanguard, the spearhead of the evangelical mm. spring that we had and, um, and had a lot of kids who loved Odyssey and boy, the families are there. All this all great. And it's really wonderful. And then we saw all those kids. We're seeing all of those kids as they grow into adulthood, just fade away. They're, mm. they're not interested in the church anymore. They're not interested in, in that. And, and, and it, it has taken, it has taken secular or other folks like a Jordan Peterson or a Bishop Robert Barron or some of those folks to come along and say the problem is meaning. You you've taken you've taken the idea of meaning out of it. You you gave we gave. I don't I don't want to say we did this all the time, but but um, or we certainly didn't do it consciously. But we kind of gave them easy answers. You know we set up a dilemma in a program early on and then wit comes in and sort of, uh, you know, wraps everything up in a nice neat bow. Uh, instead of, instead of letting them fall in love with scripture themselves, instead of them trying to grapple with it, instead of them having to go dig deeper, 
not giving them the answers necessarily, leaving things in a question mark and having them and the parents say, okay, let's answer this. Let's find out what the, what the what, what we believe. Let's go in and find out what we believe. Let's search the scriptures ourselves and find out what we believe. Uh, we've we posed a question here, and 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 now we need to search. We need to grapple. We need to uh, delve deeper, dig, dig deeper, deeper, deeper. Uh, uh, because the older I get, the more I realize there's so much more to scripture than what we ever knew growing up. There's so much more to scripture. Uh, there's things in scripture never happen randomly. Um, and you always have to add, I, I think that, I think that all, for instance, all the old Testament stories, I think that people actually did all of that. That was all done. It was, that, that's all real. People did it. It's not fairy stories, right? <laughs> but, 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 uh, in saying that everything that they did was guided. I think everything that they did in scripture was guided by the Holy spirit was guided by God, the, our triune God was still guiding everything they did. And, and everything that they did had a deeper meaning. Everything they did had a deeper meaning than just what was on the surface. And, and it's our job to pick those stories and look at that and find out what that is. Find out how that works. Um, even to the minutest detail, you can look at, at, at the details in scriptures and find out what that means. What did God mean by this? What did the, why did this person do this? Why were they there? Why, why this way instead of that way? Why, why, how come? And that's, that's, of course, things that you can only do when you're really delving and digging deeper and deeper and deeper into Scripture. And that's really where I'm at, I think. I can't speak for all the other writers on Odyssey, but I, that's where I'm at with Odyssey now, is that I really want to try to present more dilemmas, more choices, more dilemmas um, for, for listeners. I have our characters go through this, and they have to not choose between good and bad, if every choice was between good and bad or good and evil, we would probably be able to skirt by fairly, fairly easily. Our choices are not necessarily between good and evil. Our choices are between better and best. Mm. You know, our choices are between better and best. If we are choosing better, but there's a best choice out there, then better is not, not a good choice. Better is a bad choice. And sometimes that fine line is really, really difficult. And but but are we equipping young people? Are we equipping you know people, young people, older people, anybody to to know how to do that? To how how to figure out the better from best? Um, you know that that's something that I think we need to to really take a look at and um, and really start equipping uh, young people to to do. And I'm I'm hoping that what we can do in some of our episodes now will will do that. It'll help them try to gain some of those skills that are really, really necessary for our, our world, especially our world now. Mm -hmm. And yeah, pretty much even answered what would be like the final question where how you can have a, have stories that basically have, have a purpose and have some meaning. You have something you're trying to teach people, but you're not hitting people over the head with it. And uh, we, when we're talking uh, like wit likes to ask the kids questions and it's sure. kind of asking questions to us. So we have to go and think about this. We have to go search the scripture and we have to go look for the answers ourselves instead of having right. wit beat us over the head. You need to do it this way. Da, 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 da. It's, it doesn't quite exactly. work that way to warm. Now we're, yeah. we're, you're opening it up with these, uh, a lot of tough topics here in the last couple of years for us yeah. to be able to think about it and really, you know, look in what, uh, what we believe, why we believe it. And, uh, I, I even had to commend Marshall Younger for the recent, uh, storyline with Olivia Parker with her, uh, oh, yeah. uh, her doubts on her faith, which, uh, what is, was the word deconstruction that we use now, which happens a lot where people just, they deconstruct from their faith. And we've seen so many even leaders, uh, church leaders that fall away into their doubts and, yeah. I really like the way he got to some root causes that sometimes we don't want it to be true because we have to look and examine ourselves. And that's even we find, you know, non-believers, that's their thing. They don't want to have to examine themselves or hold themselves responsible for their own behavior. Uh, and if you have something that holds you to a higher regard and is looking at you that way, it's you can't you're not free to just do whatever you want to do all the time. Right. And you feel like you're, right. oh well, I have to answer for this. And people who just don't want to have to answer for that. And so, well, they'll and it's also, throw it I mean, uh, you know, even, even, even beyond just answering consequences and things like that, which are very, very important, of course. And, and it's really important to, to understand that nothing that you do is consequence less. You know, right. There's going to be a consequence for it. Um, you know, David Hume, notwithstanding, there are consequences for things. <laughs> um, all the philosophers out there will understand that. But, um, mm -hmm. 
the the idea also is I go back to this this idea of meaning. I go back to this idea of uh, of where um, where young people have have felt like the church has failed them. Mm. Uh, that, that we weren't clear on, on meaning and, and where, uh, and I don't want to, I don't want to turn this into science versus, you know, religion. I don't want to do any, anything like that, but it's an interesting, um, a lot of stuff that I've been reading and listening to lately. It, it's really been an interesting kind of, uh, topic, uh, and, and, and consideration that, that, that most of what we're, most of what we are run into in media today most of what we run into in education in media for virtually every politics virtually every realm of society is the scientific method everybody wants science you know everybody wants to view the world through the science because they think that's the way to gain knowledge and that's the way to make the best choices um you, you do it. and and um, I, again one of the people i listen to a lot is bishop robert Barron, and he he says the he, one of his things is that it's scientism it's not science we're, we're great with science science is fine science does a great a, a lot of great discoveries it's scientism that we have a problem with scientism which means that everything has to be filtered through the lens of science but science is not equipped to answer certain questions uh, we, we, we have this idea that science is the only way to gain knowledge. Mm -hmm. The only way that we have of gaining knowledge is through science. Um, and, and yet science cannot answer, why am I here? Right. Science cannot answer, what is my purpose in life? Science, science is not equipped to answer those things. Science is not equipped to say, why do we love rather than, than uh, not love? Science is not equipped to answer the question, why is there something rather than nothing? Yeah. <laughs> It, it, it can't. It can't answer those questions. It has to be, you know, because science relies on empirical data, mm -hmm. and and you can't you can't answer a question that involves where part of it involves non empirical data. You can't answer those questions using science using the scientific method. So obviously, there's more ways of gaining knowledge than just running it through science. And of course, Immanuel Kant was one of the first ones who talked about, well, we're going to take all those things that we can't really understand. We're going to put them over here and we're just going to talk about the things that we really can know. That's what we're going to talk about. And then from there spring the logical positivist who all, all say things like, well, if it, if it's not science, if we're not talking strictly science, you know, the STEM, the STEM, uh, STEM uh, parts of the university education, then everything else is not that is nonsense. It's just, it's just babble. And we don't even pay any attention to it. And we, and we really are seeing that enacted in our society. Now we're really trying to we're really, really seeing that, that, you know, all of these, I get to define who I am. Yeah. Identity politics is all about redefining words, redefining everything. And it all ends up being babble. But who can say that it's wrong because it's, you know, it, it's first of all, science won't have anything to do with it. So we could say whatever we want over here if this is all babble. Well, I mean, no, it's, it, you can't you can't look at life that way. There's there are other ways of gaining knowledge. Um, you know, there, there, there's art. Art is a way of gaining knowledge. There's, there's history. There's philosophy. There's, and then of course there's religion, and and people really want to reject religion, but but they shouldn't be they shouldn't be doing that. They shouldn't be re rejecting religion because religion is a way of gaining knowledge. It's a way of gaining understanding and knowledge that is that that science cannot answer, and yet we all experience. We all have the experience that we have to go through that says, why, again, why am I here? What, what is my purpose? Why is there something rather than nothing? Um, those are just, those are, those are kind of basic. Questions. Why do I love? Mm -hmm. why, why am I capable of that? What is love? We can, science can't answer any of those things. And, uh, you know, the best that science could do is, well, love is uh, C fibers firing in your brain. Yeah. And then that's just the physical. Response. Well, of course it's not. It's more than that. And, and philosophy offers us a philosophy, just a philosophical study. If we go back to philosophy, when it's not being reduced to science, when it's not being, uh, you know, uh, subsumed by science, we can go back to philosophy. And there are plenty of people out there who really like, you know, the idea of, uh, of, of there's more to it than that. There's 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 uh, more that we can learn about things. It's not just. Um, C fibers firing is not just things like that. There's actually more to it than that. So, I mean, we, I, 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 I'm, I've, been, I've been rambling on here, but, <laughs> but the idea behind this is that these are things that I've been thinking about quite a bit. These are things that make me really passionate to keep writing scripts on Odyssey that, that reflect this, 
the, the unfortunate thing about it is, of course, that it requires a great, great deal of, of, of thought. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, you know, a, a, an ongoing series is an animal that needs to be fed. So we can't always just spend a lot of time on, on each script. But if I, you know, I'm, I'm falling into a trap of just spending a lot of time <laughs> on these scripts and I don't get them done. I got to get them done, you yeah. know, so. Um, and you got to find so, a way to communicate these ideas to, you know, the younger listener as well yeah. as, you know, Really, and you're you're kind of aiming a little bit for kids, but also it's like the entire family can sit and listen to Odyssey and enjoy it. Sure. Uh, I've always called Odyssey everybody. a family show. Yeah. I've always thought of Odyssey as being a show for the entire family that's just written at a certain age level. Right. Um, it's kind of like newspapers. News. All the all the major newspapers in the country are written at a junior high reading news level, but they don't. <laughs> but they certainly don't stop from a content standpoint. They don't stop there. Um, you know, they they deal with everything, but they but but. This was decided a long, long time ago because they realized not everybody can read uh, at, a, at, a, at a college level. Not everybody's going to be able to read those things. So we have to be able to write it at a certain level that everybody can comprehend. Well, I feel like we kind of do the same thing. Um, we, we try to be as entertaining as we possibly can. We try to do it as adventurous as we possibly can. We want to be intriguing as we possibly can. But we want to deal with lofty um, ideas. We want to deal with ideas that are more than just milk. We want to go into the meat of things. Yeah. Uh, but but present it in a way that uh, nine to twelve year olds can understand, and even some of their younger siblings can understand. So that's what we try to do. And so far, successfully for like thirty five years. Well, <laughs> you know what's interesting about that too is is I remember one of the things that I always used to say is that um, you know to do to just bring popular culture back into it. I always used to say we take a Warner Brothers cartoon approach to Odyssey. <laughs> and, and and the Warner Brothers cartoon, what I meant by that was that there's something in it for everybody. When you're a little bitty kid and you're watching cartoons, the Warner Brothers cartoons, you like the funny characters and the colors and the action and the and, and it all comes together and gives you a certain uh, sense sensibility about it and you, you enjoy it. You get a little bit older, you start understanding the jokes. Mm-hmm. You start understanding, you, get, you start following the characters. You get a little bit older as a teenager, then you really start understanding a lot of the jokes. And then even as an adult, you start, you, you, you realize I can watch these, I can watch these cartoons and still get laughs out of them. Yeah. You know, and I've watched them now for how many years? And the reason why is because they put something in it for the entire family. They knew that those, those cartoons were going to precede a motion picture. Mm-hmm. They were the, they were the, way into a motion picture and so they knew that they were not going to just have kids there they weren't just for the kids they were also for the adults and they were trying to do slapstick humor that was for adults they were trying to do things that make the make it make adults uh laugh which was brilliantly portrayed by the way in preston sturgis's uh film sullivan's travels um i won't spoil it for you but a cartoon just watching a cartoon plays a really really important part of that of the narrative of that film and it's a very profound part of that film if you ever get a chance to watch it uh, Preston Sturgis was a great filmmaker back in the 30s and 40s. I think in the 30s of, the, of Hollywood, 30s Hollywood, he's one of the one of the premier filmmakers. Nobody remembers who he is now, but if you can look up his films, I highly recommend them. Um, but it's the same kind of thing. So uh, I, I was I was on Facebook on one of the fan sites the other day, and uh, a list, uh, you know one of the listeners, a longtime fan, said, "I find it just amazing that after all these years, I just listened to an episode that is 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 34 years old." This episode is 34, 35 years old, and I just listened to it, and the end scene in that episode is basically Wit and Connie talking, and Wit is feeling despondent about something that happened in the, I won't give it away because I want you to hear the episode, yeah. but, but uh, Wit is feeling despondent about something, and, he's feeling, and, and, and he said just the way that thing was written, just the way it was played out, all the things that happened with the writing, the direction, the acting, the performances, the music, the sound effects, everything that just the way it played out hit me right where I needed to be hit. Mm. It was something that I'm facing right now as an adult. And I heard it when I was a kid, when I was 10 years old. And now we're you know, eight years old or nine years old, 10 years old. And, and I really liked it back then. And I heard it again now, 35 years later. And I'm and it's still affecting me. And I'm like, yay, yay, we did the right thing. <laughs> You did more yeah. than the right thing. You did yeah. the best thank, thing. <laughs> thank, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What, well, all that back then was, right. you know, it would worked. It worked. Thank you, God. You knew what you were doing. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And it's just nice to have that legacy where there's, you know, uh, gr- you know, granted, like the technology is not quite the same for like those early episodes compared to what we have sure. now. I mean, sure. but yet there's still relevancy because the human condition doesn't change. 
You were well, still I think very much that was that was one of the things that we knew going into it as well, and that was one of the things that that we really really focused on was uh, trying to trying to tell great stories because we knew that the technology would change. We yeah. knew absolutely is going to change. So we knew back then. We started out on a four track machine. <laughs> wow. Okay? We started out on with four track tape. Okay, and then it went to eight track, and and so we had eight tracks. That was all we had. And if they wanted to do multi track stuff. If you had a scene that was involved um, that had a lot of, of sound effects, mm-hmm. you had to you had to mix down seven tracks to one track. Mm-hmm. So you had to mix all those seven tracks down to one track, and then that track, th- then that could be the basis for. And if you had more stuff, now you had more room to put it up there and put put more stuff on there. If you know anything about multi track recording, you put, had to put another another one. But every of course, when you mix that down to now, you have two basic tracks. Every generation of that mix down, you lose sound. So you have to compensate for it. You have to compensate. compensate. So, I mean, Dave Arnold and Bob Luttrell are brilliant. I mean, they were brilliant guys because they figured all this stuff out. And then later on, when Mark Jury came, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, all of those guys, they were so brilliant at this stuff when they, when, when they really understood, because they really understood how this, how this has to work. But we understood on the writing side, we understood on the story creation side and things like that. But look, we, we can't, technology is going to change. It's mm-hmm. going to get better. It, it, all that stuff is going to change. And so the stuff that we're hearing now, um, hopefully they can go back and remaster it later on. But even then, something else is going to happen. Something yeah. else will be better technology. What is lasting? What 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 can we do that's not going to be dependent on technology? Not that we don't love it. Not that we don't love the sound effects. Not that we don't love that. Well, you tell a great story. That's what you do. You tell a great story. And, and you do it well told. Well told as, as well as you can tell it. And so we rely on, you know, so, so still the focus is, you know, really uh, uh, story and acting, story and acting, because those are the things that people will will take away. You, those can, uh, and, and the proof of that that pudding is in is in the eating of classic motion pictures. You know, the technology has changed a whole lot since the 1930s and the 1940s. Mm-hmm way way big in motion pictures of course and now of course we've gone completely in the opposite direction where it's all about it's all about you know no no substance at all it's all style and no substance yeah uh, and, it's all, it's and, all and, blockbusters and it's all, money it's all it's all technology it's all yeah. you know computer generated stuff like that and you think yeah but where's the story what happened to the story these things these 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 shows that are so big right now I, I, I just, you can bank on it. I probably won't be here to, to, for anybody to confirm and say you were right, but I can tell you t- 10 years, 20 years from now, so yeah, they're all going to go, why did we like these? <laughs> <laughs> why, why were these so big? Why, why they're, they're so passe now. They're so, you know, the, because the, there's no story. They're all the same story and there's no story and they don't, they don't want to even deal with trying to come up with new creative ideas. They just want to, well, that worked before it made a billion dollars around the world. Let's just go ahead and do another one just like it. Yeah. That'll make another billion dollars around the world. Even if it's like a 20 years in between. Let's let's create our own culture. Forget all that culture. Let's uh, create our own culture. Yeah, and that's, that's one of the things is like, you know, being I'm I'm still a fan of Disney, but I'm more of a fan of Walt Disney and his era and the vintage Disney stuff where he would say he didn't like people talking about you know any animation he did was made for kids. He's like, No, I'm not aiming this at kids. I'm aiming this for everybody. Right. Which is right. even what his thoughts on theme parks were. It's like I you know, I my kids get to ride on this carousel and I don't get to. And so he right. creates a park where it's like, I want the whole family to be able to play together. And that's the way he approached his movies. And so I, I correct yeah. people on social media all the time and say, oh, well, you know, this is an aim for kids. I'm like, hey, Disney was not intended to be for kids. It's intended to be for the right. whole family. And maybe here they have seemed to have forgotten it in the last 10 years. Sure. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah. you know, if you go look at those, those classic films and it's now it's like they're on an apology tour of remakes because no, it, it didn't fit Terrible. the modern wokeism. Awful. But like the storytelling is brilliant back then with uh, all those original films that Walt did, and even up through the '90s, there's some brilliant yeah. storytelling. But well, now, uh, you know, you know, uh, Walt never wanted to do a sequel, and yet here we got. And even here recently, we yeah. got to look at Hocus Pocus too. And I looked at that trailer; it's like this is pretty much the same plot of the first movie, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it worked before. Let's do it again. Hey, why not? You know, we made a lot of money then. We'll make a lot of money now. I even saw people on YouTube on the trailer like, oh, they have such three. All they needed was those three women to come back. They have such great chemistry together. Like, that's all you wanted was those three. You didn't want like a good story for them. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I don't get that at all. I don't understand. That's what they wanted. They, They, you know, and that's fine. Whatever they want. I will be skipping that one. 
Um, <laughs> but, yeah. uh, you know, C.S. Lewis talked about the same thing. He used to talk about uh, people who we call uh, fairy tale stories, stories for children. Why are you writing children's stories? Why you shouldn't be writing children's stories? And he was, you know, he, he was very um, uh, adamant about why stories for children are, are not children's stories. Yeah. Uh, why, why, uh, why, if you can't write something that a child can understand, um, you shouldn't be writing it at all. I mean, things like that. He was, he was very big on, I'm misquoting him completely, but I'm reading, I'm reading his book on story on stories right now, which is a really, um, it's a really good book about oh. CSS. It's a Ooh, series nice. of that. It's a series of essays about story writing and storytelling and whatnot. And, and, um, I've read it before. I just going through it again, but, um, he, he does talk about that very thing. Why, uh, some people would look down on, uh, uh, fairy tales and think that they're not stories that, that, that kids should be reading or that certainly not something that adults would read. Why would it, why would you create a story like that? And he, he's just very, very hard on that. He doesn't, mm. he doesn't agree with that at all. And uh, and he has has very very good reasoning for it. So I highly recommend reading that that book, especially if you're a writer and you're a content creator. You want to you want to create good content. He also talks about uh, the thing that I'm I'm really focusing on right now in my own uh, non Odyssey writing, which is the objective aesthetic. Uh, what is an objective aesthetic? And for me, the objective aesthetic is God. But um, but and I think that's true for everybody. And uh, and I think that we should all try to be striving toward the objective aesthetic and everything that we do. Um, I get into a lot of arguments about people over art and what art is, what good art is versus bad art. And mm. you can't tell me that this is good art versus that bad, being bad art. And this is it. This is not, this is not something art is just in the eye of the beholder. Art is just art is you know, art is what we like and what we think is, is fun as fun and good. And I'm like, you could not be more wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it's not, it's not me saying this is not me talking about this is me trying trying to as a researcher trying to figure out what that is trying to figure out excuse me what the a objective aesthetic actually is um and lewis has a great great essay right it starts this book uh on stories it's the first essay in there and he talks about uh how how uh, uh coleridge the poet uh was was visiting a waterfall and he said, uh, I th I, I, I'm probably messing up some of the details of the story, but the gist of the story is that he was visiting a waterfall. He heard two people talking about the waterfall. And one person said that the waterfall was sublime. And the other person said that the waterfall, yes, makes him feel feelings of, you know, how, it made him feel sublime. And, and Coldridge was like so angry with the, with the second person. He could not believe how angry he just got so mad at the second person because the second person missed the point. Um, he said, you know, the waterfall for Lewis and for Coldridge and for others and everything, the waterfall is beautiful, whether it makes you, whether it, no matter how it makes you feel, mm. it's beautiful, whether you're even there to look at it or not. It's, the waterfall is beautiful, whether you're even there or not. The waterfall has intrinsic sublimity, so intrinsic beauty, intrinsic, it is beautiful in and of itself. And your feelings of your feelings are irrelevant, you know. Well, we we hear this in other areas. This is what's what's striking about the essay is we hear this in other areas. Like Ben Shapiro is always talking about facts don't care about your feelings. <laughs> right. um, you know, we hear it in the political realm. We hear it in in, in in lots of other places where we're looking for things that we can say. I would think this is an objective situation. Morality, objective morality, thing like that. When it comes to art, we just shy away from that. No, 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 no. We can't say that there's an objective standard of art. You can't say that, you know, art is, is art. And I, and I, and my thing is like what you want to like, this is what I would teach my classes. I my popular culture classes, like what you want to like. Nobody's saying you can't like what you want to like. Everybody has likes and dislikes. Everybody has guilty pleasures, like what you want to like, but, but that doesn't discount the fact that there's an objective aesthetic out there. If you go look at the grand Canyon, it's beautiful whether you're there to look at it or not. If you go look at a sea, the, the ocean at sunset, it's beautiful whether you're there to absorb it and look at it or not. It doesn't matter how you feel about it, you know. And you could take you could take somebody from the inner city, you could take somebody from the worst kinds of neighborhoods and in, the, in America and everything, and go show them the Grand Canyon and say, "Is this beautiful?" And they'll all go, "Yeah." Did you make it? No. Did anybody else make it? No. Well, how come it's beautiful? Is it beautiful just because of the way it makes you feel? Well, that, they would say, "Yeah, yeah," because it makes me feel like this and this and this. Yeah, but would it be beautiful even if you weren't here? Yes, of course it would. 
There's intrinsic beauty in things and that intrinsic beauty. And so where do we find that? Who created that? Who did that? I'm giving you like a little, little like a really, really <laughs> little stop tour of the things that I'm trying to develop here. But who created that? Who did that? How did that? Well, how did that come about? It wasn't me? Wasn't you? Wasn't any of us? We didn't create that. Who did that? Well, God did it. So you're telling me that that from an evolutionary standpoint, this is this is the stuff that when going back to what we talked about earlier, science can't answer. Right. They can't answer. Why is that beautiful? They can't answer that. Science could not possibly answer the question of what is beauty and why is that beautiful and that not beautiful. It's not a matter of personal taste. This is a matter of there's an objective aesthetic. And what is it? Where did it come from? How, who put it there? You're telling me that if random molecules came together and formed the earth like evolution says it does, just random, random stuff, it would form something that beautiful? Mm. That's what it would form? No, it would form something that's completely functional, not beautiful. Why would there be, why would beauty even enter into it? Science can't answer that. Okay. So we have to figure out what it is. So th that's where the digging comes in. That's where the more research comes in. That's where different kinds of knowledge come in. Knowledge of the beautiful knowledge of art. That's where all of that comes in. If it is the as as aesthetic, as, uh, uh, the objective aesthetic, which is truth, goodness, and beauty. So you have, what is God? God is love. What does love consist of? Love consists of truth, goodness, and beauty. What is truth, goodness, and beauty? That's the objective aesthetic. If A equals B and B equals C and C equals D, then A equals D. <laughs> what is God? God is the objective aesthetic. Okay? So that, that's the way, I mean, that's the way I'm looking at it anyway. And, 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 and I'm, I'm out to, I'm, this is a hill I'm will, willing to, to fight and die on. <laughs> uh, I mean, we have, we have example after example in Scripture of God. We say God doesn't care about art. Of course he does. Of course he cares about art. You know, in the beginning, God created. Mm -hmm. It's the fifth word of the Bible. And everything that he created in Genesis, what did he look at? He looked at back on it when he created it. He said, it's good. This is good. This is good. This is good. And then we personally, people, are his greatest creation. Because when he looked back and created us, he created us in his image. And he said, it's very good. Mm -hmm. This is very, very good. Okay? <laughs> you know? So don't tell me that God doesn't care about art, because he did. <laughs> he created art all the way down the line. And then when he's telling, okay, I want the children of Israel, I want you to create a tabernacle. I want you to go ahead and create this. As you're wandering through the wilderness, you create a tabernacle. And here's what you do. You get this guy and this guy, because I bless them with creative talent. Right. I bless them with skills. And they know how to do what I'm going to tell you I want. I want this. I want it to look like this. I want it to be this measurement. I want it to be this way. I want it to do that. And it's, yeah, it's totally functional, but it's also beautiful. There's beauty in it. I, I, why put the pomegranates in there? Why put the, you know, why make the labor look like it did? Why make it out of beaten gold? Why do, why do any of that stuff? Because there's beauty in it. And, and who has the beauty? Who has the objective aesthetic? God does. God, God does. So, uh, you know, people, of course, are going to come out and believe in God. So you can't maybe, you know, you know the, 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 all that, that just nullifies your arguments. No, that just means that you haven't dug far enough. You know? <laughs> all it means is that you haven't given it enough thought. You know, you, 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 you want to reject the arguments. So you can't. There's a there was a great debate between a religious leader and uh, Bertrand Russell. And I don't remember the religious leader, but they talked about this sort of thing. They talked about about uh, uh, the idea of why is and the and the religious leader. And I wish I could remember his name said, why is there something rather than nothing? He, he used he posed that question to Bertrand Russell and Bertrand Russell refused to answer the question. He refused to engage with it. Mm. OK, he was really kind of being ultra logical positivist and say, that question has no meaning, and I refuse to even engage with it. And he said, what are you talking about? That question has no meaning. It's a, it's a well-formed question. It, it's, I re and then, and then he, the, the religious guy, and I forgot who it was, he, he really got Bertrand Russell when he said, he said, I refuse to believe that a man is as smart as you are, cannot comprehend the question, why is there something rather than nothing? <laughs> I, I refuse to believe that. I refuse to believe that a man as smart as you are cannot oh, comprehend that question. <laughs> so it's it's just it's just a great it's a great question and, it, and it's something that's well worth uh, delving into it's something that we really need to delve into i think and it's something that we've lost in our in our popular culture with all of its social media and all of its digital whatever whatnot so we we just need to try to turn to it as much as we possibly can and grapple with it and, and, and turn to scripture for some answers and it's such a relevant question that there's an entire comedy book 
The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, set on pretty much on the basis of why. <laughs> the question. It is the question. Why? Yeah. <laughs> And as exactly. the entire comedy based exactly. on that entire question. And of course the yep. answer is 42. Yep. <laughs> yep. And Douglas Adams could not, could not have missed the mark more. You know, yeah. is it, what's interesting about this is that this is, these are questions that everybody asks all the way through. These are, I mean, these are, these are going to be questions that logical positives and scientists and scientism people and religious people, we all ask these same questions. Why is there something rather than nothing? The, the, that whole thing at the very beginning of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where there are a lot of very, very smart people who think this has all happened before and will happen again. You know, there's a, all, all of that stuff. Well, everybody, everybody thinks through those questions. We're all thinking through those questions, mm -hmm. but, but the unfortunate the thing is, because I have I have all five series of the Hitchhikers, the the audio series. I oh love the Hitchhikers. I love. <laughs> I listen to it in the car all the time. Um, uh, so I'm I, I you know I'm always putting in the cassettes, putting in the but and, and and because because he reaches some some amazingly poignant moments. He has mm -hmm. some really really believably poignant moments, and and really of course very very funny things too. And has these great conversations and and, and all this stuff. And he and and. Doggone it! If he doesn't come to the exact wrong conclusion every right. single time, every single time, it's like, how can you miss this? How can you miss it? You miss it so badly. How can you miss it? You ask these philosophical questions, and then you revert it. You reduce it to scientism. If it's not scientism, yeah. then it, you, know, you, you you just reduce it to that, and it's like, no, 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 no. Keep going. Keep going. You'll get the answer there if you just keep going. But you just you just can't. Yeah. You just can't can't do it like he just couldn't do it so yeah too bad <laughs> well we should probably wrap this up <laughs> <laughs> this was a very different that, conversation than i expected you know i was going to talk about the craft of writing how you got started with writing but no this was a whole different type of show this time <laughs> you know what uh I'll have me back and we'll talk about that i can i love to i love talking about the craft of writing and, and and all of that so i i know that i know that we're all limited in time but i'm more than willing if you guys want if you want to come if you want to have another conversation i'm always available just let me know when all righty well we'll definitely have to set something up but ladies and gentlemen neverlanders phil lawler which by the way how if people wanted to be able to find any other of your works i mean like the blackguard chronicles you wrote all of those i believe didn't you so you got yes, some I, written fact, books writing, out there i'm writing the last I'm writing the last three right now. Uh, they're they're killing me, but I'm writing them. <laughs> uh, we also have the Young Wit books. Uh, Dave Arnold and I wrote those. Uh, there are five of those. Uh, those will be released along with the Blacker Chronicles, assuming I can get them finished next year. So they'll have all slipcase covered box sets of all of them available a year from now. And um, and then of course there's Iliad House, which is uh, which is my other series that I created to come out five or five or six years ago. Uh, that's all self-funded, so everybody's asking me, when is the when is the, the next series of Alien House coming out? Well, as soon as I have time and money, that's when it's coming <laughs> out. So, uh, but you can find that you can find that uh, if you go on Facebook, you'll see my my uh, background is Alien House. Um, and if you if you want if if anybody wants uh, to know about Alien House, they can they can private message me and I can uh, send them a copy of it and we can work out all that stuff too so there's lots of lots of different things i'm always i'm constantly writing stuff constantly doing stuff um uh, I, I i appear in places that people would think i'm not going to be doing any and then i suddenly just pop up so uh, <laughs> keep, keep, keep an ear out and an eye out and and and, and everything and you, you probably hear something that i've been doing so constantly <laughs> working all right well thank you so much for coming on to the show thank you for having me All right, as we wrap up today's show, of course, we do like to invite you to go to NeverlandPodcast.com. There, even in the middle of the page there, you're going to find a little link that'll get you, if you happen to be a podcaster, to go to my podcast reviews. That's also a good way that you can go and uh, leave a review for the show, which I do appreciate when you do that. And share the show with people. If you're enjoying the show, please share it. I need to rebuild the show to what it once was. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've cut down my audience by half here lately. Uh, and I really would love to get this back out there. We're doing something different now than what we've previously done. We get the same. Uh, it's a different type of show, but hopefully it's better you know, with some of the things we're doing now. But I want to thank Karen Kennedy, Ricky Pope of Christian Nerds Unite, and Darren Wilhite of the Wilhite and Wall Show for their contributions to the opening of the show. Remember, you can email us, podcast at neverlandpodcast.com. Find us on Twitter. Find both of our locations on Facebook. There's both a group and a fan page. 
And if you go to the website, NeverlandPodcast.com, you can also join the Neverlanders. We haven't had any new Neverlanders in a good long time. I haven't really pushed on it, but that's where you get, choose your official nickname as a Lost Boy or a Pixie. Why do we have Pixies? Because girls are too clever. They don't get lost. Uh, but we're working on some new guests coming up next week. I, I need to do a little bit more to get them on. Uh, we're hoping to have Jim Corcus on again real soon. He's gotten hit with Hurricane Ian, but he's got an awesome new book I want to talk to you about. Uh, so hopefully we'll have this coming up really soon. And don't forget, join our Patreon page, please. Patreon.com slash Neverland Podcast. Your help really does make a difference. But for now, get lost. In an adventure! Adventure!